Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carolyn, and on behalf of Kingston Libraries, a very warm welcome to our special Remembrance Day talk this afternoon with Dr. Lucas Jordan on the topic of our return diggers. Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are all remotely situated today and to pay my respects to the elders past and present as a and wisdom of this land that we all call Australia. I'd like to start with a little bit of housekeeping just to get that out of the way. Uh, Lucas will take questions at the end of the talk. If you would like to ask a question of Lucas, please go to slido.com, which is S-L-I-D-O.com on your phone or other device and type in the code Q845 and you can post your question and see other questions that people have posted. And that uh, code is on the bottom of the screen so you can see it easily if you need to refer to it again. Also, just to let you know that we are recording today's talk. Alrighty, over to the reason that we're here today. So, just a little bit of background information. At the end of World War I, the Australian Imperial Forces and the Australian Government was faced with the administrative and logistical task of returning 167,000 Australian soldiers uh, from, from the war. Now, everybody in Australia uh, were very anxious to welcome home their brothers and sons and husbands. But they also had some concern about new things that uh, the soldiers might be bringing with them, such as influenza um, or new ideas like Bolshevism. So there was a, a great effort put in to compensate and support the returned men um, so that they might fit into society peacefully. Some made this transition seemingly without difficulty. Others struggled with things like war wounds or trauma from the war. Dr. Jordan's talk today will consider five diggers and how they coped when they returned to Australia. Two of these are local brothers, Dudley and Percy Tregan of Carrum. And also he will be talking about three prominent characters from his book, Stealth Raiders, A Few Daring Men in 1918. Lucas has pieced together their stories um, by talking to their children and grandchildren. So I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Lucas Jordan and to pass over to you, Lucas, for your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, and thank you, Kingston Libraries. And it's a pleasure to be talking to everybody online today um, about a topic which is probably close to all of our hearts. Um, and also a topic that it's always interesting to try to fill the gaps. Um, and by that, I mean uh, family history is always a quest to find out um, things about our returned soldiers. Uh, some things have been left in silence while other things have been archived. And that's one of the quests that I enjoy as a historian. Um, I'm a teacher by day and a historian and author author of Stealth Raiders, and I had the pleasure of talking to the Kingston patrons about Stealth Raiders a couple of years ago. Uh, but for the past eight or nine years, I've enjoyed speaking to the family members of returned soldiers, um, particularly the children of the men of the First World War and their grandchildren. Um, it's remarkable that there are still quite a few old 90-year-olds out there um, who've got stories to tell about their family and uh, I find it quite exciting uh, to record these stories while they're still there. And, and I think it's one of the, the challenges that we have now that we've been through the, the commemoration of a century since the war. The big question is, well, what happened next? Um, why am I so interested? In my younger days, I worked in the bush with Aboriginal people and I learnt out there, um, if you wanted to move about the country, you had to go and speak to the old people. Um, you know, the government might have owned the roads, a pastoralist might have owned the cattle, um, but the country belonged to the traditional people, the original people. And to talk history, you had to go and find the elders. And I think I've brought that to my history. I'm an academic historian, like most historians. I go to the archive, I go to primary sources, 
Um, but those experiences as a young 20, 30 year old in the bush have made um, speaking to elders a really, really uh, pertinent part of the way I go about my history. So when we're talking today about these five diggers, I just want to sort of point out to you, we'll be tapping into what the archives say about them, uh, what the official history say about them, but we'll also have a little bit of a look at family memory. Um, and what's been really moving in looking at family memory with families over the years is, you know, sometimes everybody basically feels much pride to have a digger ancestor. But in other families, they're, they're trying to answer questions. You know, a lot of these men didn't speak about the war um, or, the, or there are issues that arose after the war and, and families are often confront trauma when you go back over these things. So I want to acknowledge that up front today. Um, some of the people who I'll tell you about today, the, the grandchildren and children of these diggers, I, I really respect them for their honesty um, and for some of the things that they shared with me, knowing that they would be shared with a wider public because some of it's pretty painful stuff. But at the same time, let's just begin with the general impression of a return to Australia. So I'll begin with a soldier's return, his personal and public return. And then we'll look at the Australia that these men returned to and the long decade between the two wars and how these men survived that decade. Because it's Remembrance Day, I couldn't give you a sweeping biography of all five men. We just don't have the time. So I want to talk about how these five diggers remembered their fallen mates and remembered their friends who were in hospitals whose youths had been ruined by the war and how they remembered the wives and children of some of the soldiers who didn't return. So that'll be an overarching theme today. One of my favourite quotes of returns was written in a diary by a young bloke called Albert Eddie Edwards of the 1st Battalion. And Albert Edwards was your typical frontline soldier. And frontline soldier was a term of endearment that only the men who fought closest to the enemy were entitled to use or entitled to apply on another soldier. Eddie Edwards had been at the war for two and a half years. He'd spent numerous nights in lonely listening posts in no man's land. He'd been on patrols and raids. He'd been over the top. He'd suffered the humiliation of barrages. He'd carried the Russians to the front under fire. He knew the job of an infantryman well. He'd earned a military medal for holding onto a post when all seemed lost near Passchendaele in 1917. But on his return home, imagine as he comes in his ship after all that experience, and he's coming into Sydney Harbour, the beautiful blue waters, the red roofs in the distance, you know, no bridge, no opera house, just the smell of the gum trees. And as he's looking, he writes in his diary, or he recalls in his diary, Sydney Harbour in its thin veil of mist looked very beautiful but nobody was looking at the scenery. Everybody was running hither and thither in search of a familiar play, familiar face. Down the gangway, into my mother's arms, and I am home. It's so natural, so normal, a reaction after such an extreme experience of a warrior's life. I think it's something that we can all relate to, that contact, that personal contact back with family, back with loved ones. And the photo that you can see on your screens captures a similar image. Uh, the lad in the middle is Jack Hayes, and he's one of the people we'll be talking about today. Now, I, I've come to know Jack Hayes quite well. When I look at this photo, I see how much he's aged. He's 23 in this photo, and he's been at the war since the beginning. He signed up in August of 1914. Um, I think this, if this was an official photo that was held by the War Memorial, it would be an iconic image of return. I believe it's his sister to his right. It's his doctor to his left. You can see the doctor carrying the, the typical doctor's bag. Um, but this photo was given to me or gifted to me or copied for me by his granddaughter, um, Helen Thompson. His granddaughter's Helen Thompson and Nolan Moore. Uh, when I was writing Stealth Raiders, Prominent diggers would pop up and I'd contact their families or in the hope of finding further diaries and letters and so forth. And as I was alluding to earlier, the Hayes family have been close companions 
as I've researched and, and they've researched the stories of what happened next. So we'll get back to Jack later. As well as relating to those personal homecomings and those very public homecomings, the celebrations in towns, on the wharves, in the cities, uh, in the halls of country towns, another thing that we can almost ironically relate to now is that a lot of these young men came home in 1919 wearing face masks and a lot of them spent you know, at least 10 days in quarantine at sea when they could smell those gum leaves, when they were in sight of Australia. And we could perhaps more than any generation since then sympathise or empathise with that after what we've gone through recently. Um, although I don't think that generation ended up with the same lockdown heck hairdos uh, as, as many of us have. What surprised me when I was considering the things that we can all relate to, when I really dug into the archives and dug into the stories, I hadn't realised how divisive Australia was in 1919 and indeed how, how much friction there was in society for the ensuing decade. Um, if we think of society as a fabric, from about 1916, 1917 onwards, Australia had been torn to shreds. And some of those divisions within, within society seemed violable. And, and these things came down to probably, you know, for the sake of our talk today, four things. Of course, mourning, the sheer scale of death uh, struck Australia, struck this small country, four, four million odd people, very, very harshly. But then think of the civilians at home. Think of the mothers of these blokes and their brothers who are working at home. During the war years, the price of essentials, milk, bread, butter, nearly doubled. And whilst wages rose, they never kept pace with the inflation. So the average working Australian was living literally on the breadline, you know, close to poverty. And with so many sons and mates at the front, most families, indeed nearly all families, were also contributing to war bonds and to patriotic funds. So the war had, had meant huge sacrifices for the average Australian back home. On top of this, there was a large amount of industrial unrest. You know, for these working families, they could see that there were some in industry and business in Australian society who had profited from the war. And, you know, it was a common cry at that time. You know, you know, our, our sons are at the war and you are profiting from their sacrifice. Unions and industrial groups also wanted a slice of the profits. And in particularly 1917 onwards, there was great industrial unrest, numerous strikes. The general strike of 1917, which began in the New South Wales railway workshops, um, over an issue that you know any generation would be familiar with, uh, new technology that supervised and monitored the efficiency and the working hours of the men on the workshop floor at Everly in Sydney. Men went out on strike over this, and that, that strike quickly spread. It spread uh, to the waterfront in Melbourne, to coal mines in Newcastle. It became a general strike, which ultimately had about 173,000 men striking and about 5 million lost working days. While all this is happening, there's a Bolshevik revolution in Russia. You know, monarchies around the world, including the British Empire, rocked by this, this, this spectre, this thought of the worker rising up and usurping uh, traditional institutions and structures of government. Meanwhile, and perhaps the most divisive was the conscription referendum. As you probably know, in 1916 and 1917, there were two failed conscription referendum. These referendum were not necessarily so much over pro-war and anti-war groups, but it was about volunteerism versus compulsion. The 330,000 odd Australian soldiers who went to the war all went as volunteers, and Australians, particularly Australian soldiers, were fiercely proud of that. But as the war dragged on, the British government had put a lot of pressure on the Australian government, Billy Hughes, the Prime Minister, to fulfil a quota of troops for the front. 
So Hughes and loyalist groups um, started to demand conscription. Both of those conscription referendum resulted in the Australian people by the narrowest of margins saying there should be no conscription. And the reasons why people were on either, one or either side were many and varied. You know, history paints really broad strokes. And if you read the newspapermen of the time, if you look at the politicians and the clergy, you can see that there was a, a sectarian split between ca Irish Catholic background Australians and, let's say, Protestant loyalists. But these things never really quite capture the truth. Um, conscription shattered the Australian Labor Party, the party that had been in power at the beginning of the war. And that party didn't recover for probably 15 years, arguably not until the next war. Um, so to shatter a party like the Labor Party at that time, which was the rising power, political power in Australia before the war, suggests that this, the rifts of conscription were much broader than sectarian lines alone. All these things meant that Australian society was full of deep anxieties as these men returned from overseas. They returned, as we said before, were they bringing the Spanish flu? Yeah. Were they bringing venereal diseases? Were they bringing new ideas? And how would these men, so used to gathering in large groups, how would they respond to Australian democracy? All these things governments and leaders were concerned about. But families and communities were concerned too. Of course, at first they welcomed their sons home, they loved these boys, they, they wrapped their arms around them, they celebrated their return in the, in the odd fellows halls and various places in their communities. But the diggers were highly visible. And you only have to look at um, you know some of the wonderful books that have been written, My, My Brother Jack by George Johnson, um, R.E. Lording's There and Back, which he wrote under the, the name Tivichok. And these books tell you how the digger looked to the civilian Australia in 1919, 1920, 1921. You know, when the diggers returned, you could find them involved in this industrial unrest on either side of the picket line. In Fremantle, uh, in the Battle of the Barricades, where, where the dockyard bike for refusing to unload quarantine ships, there were diggers on either side of that picket. Uh, in Brisbane, mobs of returned men ransacked their way through supposedly Eastern European suburbs or parts of the city, um, calling out red flaggers or communists. But there was the more typical mobs of blokes hanging around, gambling, you know, up the sides of the streets of the pubs, sitting on balconies and verandas, drinking, carousing, hedonistic, chauvinistic, often dis disrespectful of civilian authority. The manly freedom of army life didn't look a happy fit with Australian domestic bliss. Imagine the consternation of some of these mums when their boys return home. And I do, I think of a lad called Ari Lording, who, who I mentioned before in his book There and Back. Lording signed up at 16, was gravely wounded by the time he was 18 and returned to Australia immediately after the war, underwent 52 operations in and out of morphine addiction. And in his book, he describes con often constant gatherings with mates, singing and carousing and drinking, you know, here's to the good old beer, mop it down, mop it down. These were the songs and sounds of the diggers when they gathered together. And these sometimes shocked mothers, aunties, sisters, and the respectable people in the community. The diggers also talked about politicians getting their issue. They wished to heap the coals that the Germans had heaped on them onto some of these politicians who they thought had failed to fulfil their promises to the diggers. You know, throughout the 20s and into the 30s, particularly by the time of the Depression, there were digger groups, militias, that formed in the shadows um, who were quite, who talked of and were quite willing to overthrow dem democratically elected governments. And I'm referring to groups like the New Guard in New South Wales and the White Guard in Victoria, often consisting largely of middle-class uh, returned officers. The diggers were a powerful political force once they returned from the war too. The politicians had made promises 
that there would be comp there'd be compensation for their efforts and their sacrifices. The diggers expected to be returned to their jobs. They expected to be given preference in their jobs. They expected to get land for farms and houses, and they expected pensions to cover the costs of their wounds and the livings of the widows. But even before the Great Depression began to set in in 1928, there wasn't enough jobs to go around. Of the just over 50% of eligible Australian males went to the war, which means that a similar number had not gone. And those men also required and needed and demanded full employment. Women too had started to make inroads into the workforce. Many of the clerking jobs that had been reserved for men before the war were now ably and capably being done by women. So this trend, the assumption, the demand that they would return to their jobs was met with, again, some suspicion, bitterness and anxiety. But for all this, it's always important to, to stop and consider that most of these, being young men, sought to find jobs. They sought to find wives and meaning in their lives. They knew that they had changed and they knew that everything around them, whether in their homeland, seemed to have changed too. But many expressed great relief at being home and were keen to take up domestic and civilian responsibilities. What I want to talk to you today about the return of five of these lads is the way in which they remembered their mates. All of them carried the Anzac legend on their shoulders. So in that long decade after the war, as they made that transition from warrior to civilian and slowly merged back into their communities, most of them were determined not to forget. And so today I'm going to introduce to you to a couple of five extraordinary diggers, your local boys, Dudley and Percy Tregent, who you can see there in the top left of the image. In the top right is Dalton Neville, MC, DCM, mentioned in dispatches, quite a jour. Bottom left, Jack Hayes. And we first saw the photo of him on the previous slide at his homecoming. And in the bottom right, Walter Ernest Brown, Wally Brown, VC, DCM. I've put the cross in the middle because this is a cross that one of these lads had made and carried himself to the battlefields to honour his best mate and fallen comrade. And that's the symbol of today's talk, how these returned men in turn remembered their friends. Let's start with Dudley and Percy Tregent of Carrum. Dudley and Percy were born in Japarit on the Wimmera River in Western Victoria in the 1890s to school teacher pre uh, parents Frederick and Alice Tregent. They were part of an old Warbra family. The boys were educated in Ballarat. But when the war began, Dudley and Percy were living with their mum, Alice, and sister at Mascot Avenue by the Patterson River in Carrum, probably close to where some of our listeners are. Their father, a school teacher, had been absent for 15 years, and the boys were raised in a patriotic middle class family, staunch Church of England. Their mother, Alice, a school teacher also, was active in the local community, an honorary secretary of the Carrum branch of the Australian Women's National League. This was a conservative women's organisation established in 1904 to support the monarchy and empire, to combat socialism, educate women in politics and safeguard the interests of the home, women and children. At its peak, the Australian Women's National League was the largest and arguably most influential conservative women's organisation in the country. When the war began, the boys enlisted from an intensely patriotic family. Dudley and Percy enjoyed riding horses and playing footy and cricket. Dudley, who's standing in the photo, debuted for the Carrum's first grade 11, aged only 14. And I, I found by exploring in the, in the newspapers, you know, one thing you'll always find, if someone was a sportsman, you'll always find a reference to them in a, in a batting list or a, a, in, in the court and bold section of the newspapers. Um, and a local newspaper from just before the war described him as a promising batsman and tip-top fielder. 
and encouraged it with further coaching, the boy should be heard of in the future. The newspaper man finished with a typical sort of public schoolboy flurry. Good lad, Tredgy, he wrote. After completing their schooling, Dudley and Percy took jobs as clerks. Dudley as an officer in the lands department, Percy as an accountant. And when the war began in August 1914, both boys were still in their teens. Being under 21 required that you had to have a parent sign your consent. As each boy came upon his 18th birthday, Mother Allen signed them up. Dudley enlisted in 1915, December. Percy, later in 1917. We can find the details of their of their enlistments through the Australian National Archives, such as you know blue eyes, um, fair complexions, slim build. Both brothers were about five foot six. Dudley began his service in France in December of 1916 with the rank of gunner, which was the artillery's equivalent of a private. He served with the 107th Battery of the Seventh Field Artillery Brigade and eventually reached the rank of sergeant. His job involved leading a team of men and horses pulling four guns. And this is a contemporary picture of his battery working in the field, firing the gun, the 4.5-inch howitzer. The 4.5-inch howitzer was a breech-loading cannon that could fire a 16-kilogram shell for a distance of about seven kilometres. It was an efficient and effective weapon firing high explosive shells. It also had a remarkable elevation, which meant it could be used to lob shells into trenches and strong points. Percy, the younger brother, fought as an infantryman in the Victorian 59th Battalion, commanded by the famous Australian fighting general Pompey Elliott. When Percy joined the battalion, was fresh from their success in the capture of Villa Bretonneur. Percy, with these veterans around him, took part in the Battle of Amiens on the 8th of August 1918. This was one of the most decisive battles of the war. The Australians advanced about 11 kilometres in a day, captured 173 guns and over 7,000 German prisoners. It was really the beginning of the end for the German army. From then on, the Australians relentlessly pushed by their commander Monash, pushed the Germans back, back, back. The idea being to push them east across the Somme where, where it made a bend from in a north-south direction at Peron, so that by the time of the winter, the Germans could not use the river as part of their defence. The picture on your screen is a, is a painting from 1918 by an artist called Fullwood, and it depicts Percy's brigade and the attack on Peron which is the walled medieval city in the mid-distance. In the bottom right-hand corner is a quite famous poignant photo of Australian dead in the barbed wire fields around Peron. During this attack, Percy was badly wounded. His femur and his leg was shattered and he was hospitalised in England. Meanwhile, his brother, Dudley, who'd been in action since December of 1916, advanced with the artillery. The job of the artillery during these, uh, these last 100 days of the war was to fire creeping barrages in support of Australian attacks. Dudley fought in the last Australian battle of the war at Montbrahane in October 1918. And then, when the majority of the Australians in Monash's Australian Corps were being withdrawn from the line for a well-earned rest, there was a select few who were asked to stay behind to assist and advise more inexperienced British and American troops. Dudley being a sergeant and probably a fine leader of men was ordered to stay behind with this group. On the 17th of October 1918, just days before the armistice, Dudley was wounded by shell fire and permanently blinded. Now, back in the day, an author by the name of Rex Hall wrote a book about the life of Dudley Tregent. And in that book, he includes a passage describing Dudley shortly after his wounds. When Dudley was evacuated to England, some wrangling meant that he and his brother 
were put in beds next to each other in the hospital. Paul records in, in his book, published in 1979, that the two brothers lay, lay next to each other and shared their anxieties about their return home after the war. Dudley told Percy that he was not going to sell matches in the street. Now, this time, as part of the repatriation of Australian soldiers, there was a lot that a man could do to educate himself in England before he left. Dudley had the problem of being blind. He had the problem of him not yet recovered from his wounds. Regardless of this, he enrolled in Braille and an arts and law degree while still in England at St Dunstan's College for the Blind. Here he met an American nurse, Eileen Sharp, and Eileen shared his drive and determination. Eileen was herself a war veteran. She'd served in France with the Harvard Medical Unit and had held the unique distinction of being the first American nurse to be mentioned in British Army dispatches. Dudley and Eileen married in London in July 1920. They returned to Australia shortly afterwards. Dudley took up his degree with gusto at the University of Melbourne. Within three years, he had completed his Bachelor of Arts, First Class Honours in Political Economy. He went on to gain a Bachelor of Laws, a Master of Laws with Honours, finishing second in his class. And he'd done this all in the typical time, you know, which if anybody who's been to university knows, that's quite a mission in itself. It was an incredible achievement. And that headline in the middle of your screen, Sincerity and Grit, sums up Dudley's character. And if ever there was to be another book written about Dudley or an exhibition at the Kingston Libraries on Dudley, it would make a fine title, wouldn't it? Sincerity and Grit. Dudley established the Collins Street law firm Dudley Trigent & Co. And he went on to have a successful career in the law, just become a family tradition. However, as I've said earlier, the purpose of today's talk is to speak about what these return men did in turn to remember their mates. In 1923, a group of ex-soldiers, returned men, who happened to be mostly businessmen, formed a group in Melbourne called the Legacy Club. The idea of the club was service. And after a while, they realised that the, the service that they would give would be to the children of their fallen comrades. Dudley joined Legacy in its foundation years. He became its honorary solicitor and treasurer. He gave free legal advice to deceased servicemen's dependents, gratuitously and willingly, and always refused to accept any fees. Perhaps Dudley's greatest contribution to the memory of returned servicemen and their dependents was his advocacy for war widows' rights. In the 1920s, war widows were suffering. Their pensions had been set in 1914. And as I discussed earlier, the cost of living had gone through the roof since then. War widows were struggling. Dudley took up the torch in defence of the war widows in advocacy for an increase in their pension. He must have been some negotiator and he wouldn't have been bad in a moot court at university, I would think. He targeted the politicians. In one newspaper report, and I'll quote it, he criticised these politicians, quoting, the salaries of members of the House of Representatives have been increased from £600 to £1,000 a year to meet the increased cost of living. This, cre this increase, apparently, is regarded as not affecting the widows. And he called on the return soldier movement. He said, the miserable pittance paid to war widows should cause deep shame and humiliation to every digger. With, with the legacy's endorsement, Dudley lobbied the federal government to increase the pension and to recognise certain illnesses, such as cancer, as war caused. In 1928, Dudley, Legacy and the War Widows Guild achieved some success. The pension was raised and it was timely too because within months the Great Depression which struck the world would be upon Australia. When Dudley died in 1971, his legacy comrades remembered him as a man who though deprived of his sight, quote, certainly developed one great attribute, compassion for which he will always be 
affectionately remembered. When I was researching Dudley's life, I came across a, a nice story in the Berwick Star News written by Nika Simonis, in which she'd interviewed Dudley's granddaughters. And they told fond stories of visiting Dudley at his law offices in the city, dressing in their finest clothes to go and see him, and stories of going on picnics with him where they'd pull at his socks and, and trousers and he'd, he'd laugh. And, and most importantly, they remembered what he'd inspired in them, that by teaching us, you can do anything you want. What about his brother, Percy? Percy's life is harder to find in the records, but no less meaningful. He spent two years in hospital on his return from the war. He must have been about at least 21 by the time he had got out of hospital. His name pops up in, the, in newspapers in Frankston and around the Kingston area for involvement in cricket and football, coaching, refereeing a good community man. And as I said at the beginning, I think we're turning now towards these stories of what happened next. And for my, it's a, ch it's a challenge to the community to find out more about these men, these everyday soldiers, and what happened to them when they returned. And it's to a few blokes like that that I want to turn to next. The next chap is Dalton Neville. I came across Dalton Neville while I was researching Stealth Raiders. Uh, he was the sort of bloke who appeared in Bean's official history of the war. And when I read the war diaries of men from the 55th Infantry Battalion and the official war diaries that were written by its officers, Dalton's Neville's name always seemed to pop up. He was a, a fearless sort of a soldier. But before we talk about his soldiering, I'll just give you a little bit of a brief on his background. He was born in Singleton in New South Wales, and as a boy, he loved the bush. He used to ride his bike between the distant country towns and help drovers cross their stock across the Hunter River. He passed on his love of the bush to his son, Dalton Jr. And once I'd found Dalton Neville in the archives, I got in contact with Dalton, and we began a long and fruitful correspondence. And I think probably for Dalton, sometimes quite difficult. Um, but I have him to thank for these photos and for the notes and records that his father kept and passed on to his son. When Dalton went to the war at age 19, he was thrown straight into frontline service. He recalled, at the age of 20 as a corporal, I was shoved out into no man's land with one other man to act as a listening post. From that night on, until I was badly wounded in July 1918, I was out in no man's land nearly every night. I had the flair, or it was cultivated in me, or because I was with the battalion a long time and knew the ropes. In 1917, he earned the Distinguished Conduct Medal and four mentions in dispatches for his work in no man's land. He was recognised as being involved in, a, in basically a fist fight in no man's land that resulted in the capture of a German that gave some of the first news on, on the withdrawal of the German army to the Hindenburg line. By 1918, he had an added incentive, a bitter incentive. His brother Tom, younger brother Tom, had been killed in the fighting of the Third Battle of Ypres. And Dalton had revenge on his mind, or vengeance on his mind. He earned an MC in the summer of 1918 for leading impromptu raids against German machine gun posts hidden in the crops east of Villa Bretonneau. And he was reportedly the Australian who carried a sign, a painted sign into no man's land and left it on the parapet of a German trench which said this far and no further as a marker that the German Michael offensive had ended. The pictures I've included on this page, of course, are of Dalton up the top. With, you can see the note in the bottom corner, lots of love, Dalton. The picture in the middle actually depicts the 41st Australian Infantry Battalion and some of its stealth raiders. And it's very much akin with the sort of work that Dalton Neville did in No Man's Land in 1918. Small groups of men stealing their way through young crops. You can see a flare rising over the battlefield, silhouetting the German machine gun post by that broken remnant of a tree 
The cemetery in the background marks a British cemetery from the fighting in 1916. These men were fighting over old battlefields, over the bones and graves of their mates. And on the right, in that boy's own style uh, comic of the era, is a picture of a stealth raider. This comes from a New Zealand uh, magazine, and it's, it's depicting a, a lad called Travis VC of New Zealand, Otago Regiment. But I've put it in here because, like Travis, uh, who was known as the king of no man's land in the New Zealanders, Dalton Neville was known as the king of no man's land amongst the Australians. And he had the rare honour of being given two revolvers because his work was close range, up, up front, personal and deadly. In 1918, towards in July, he was seconded to the British Army north of the Somme River. The British Army was full of inexperienced young conscripts and Dalton, with about a dozen Australians, was sent across the river to train the, the English in raiding and patrolling techniques. Now, the English were under pressure to capture prisoners and rather than training the young Tommies, Dalton and the Aussies decided to go out and do the job for them. One of the problems sometimes with stealth raiding was the Australian would go out without asking permission choosing the time when and where to go. And while it was often successful, it could also lead to disaster. And on this occasion, Dalton going out with a group of Aussies, having told nobody, was fired on in no man's land by British, German and Australian troops alike. He was severely wounded, shattered thigh, wounded hip. His war was over. When he returned to Australia, he had a job in the Commonwealth Bank in Singleton to go to, but he couldn't handle being indoors. He said he needed to be outside all of the time. Numerous jobs followed and three marriages. He tried his hand in various family businesses in motoring and engineering, car salesman. He went on surveying gangs out into the outback and tried going to sea for a while. Eventually, he chose a life of isolation, first at Budgerwoy and later on Lake Macquarie. His first marriage ended very quickly. He married in 1920. They had a young boy who died of pneumonia and the marriage dissolved soon afterwards. Dalton remarried. That marriage broke down. His eventual partner, he couldn't marry, having not divorced his second wife. And for the rest of his life, Dalton's son, who was born of that last uh, relationship, said his father fought the paper wars. The repatriation department wouldn't recognise Dalton's partner and Dalton's son because they weren't part of a, let's say, an official marriage. All the while, Dalton's health became more and more damaged by the war. Uh, he called it neurasthenia. Today we'd probably call it P PTSD. Um, and one of the things that is remarkable about Dalton Neville, and it's worthwhile recalling now. He, he kept the record of all the letters that he wrote to the repatriation department. So what I'm about to tell you next must be considered in that light. By 1937, Dalton had wrote, I'd become erratic in my work, indifferent to discipline, dangerous in my driving, had lost powers of concentration, and my earning capacity was practically nil. This sort of thing has been going on for years. So realising I had lost my grip, I decided to get away from the noise and bustle. I was losing my memory, accepting the war. Each year that has become more vivid. I spoke more of it and lived it all over again. That war is always with me. And I know that after my years of active service, the experiences I went through and the type of work I did there, is it any wonder I am neurasthenic? As Dalton struggled with gambling and drink and, and, and couldn't hold down a job, one of the things he did, perhaps, for, perhaps purely for money, perhaps because it, was, because it was cathartic, he would record stories that were printed in the newspapers. And here's an example of two of those stories here. This far and no farther tells the story of the sign that he put in no man's land to tell the Germans that their attack, their Michael offensive had finished once they'd met the Australians. World Super Raider, Diggers Adopt Indian Warfare tells of the brutal hand-to-hand -hand fighting that Dalton was very experienced in. 
those stories are recounted in, in my book, Stealth Raiders, uh, which some of you may have already read. Dalton, the memory of the war, never could, he could never get it out of his mind. And his son has, has told me some very important things about how he remembers his father. The outdoor life was probably perhaps the only thing that gave Dalton solace, and it was a love of the outdoors that he passed on to his family. But in his age in his 70s, Dalton Neville took his own life after a bout of drinking and gambling. He took his life with the rifle that he kept loaded by his bedside every night, even into his 70s. His son, Dalton Jr., wrote me this letter. Dad's ending his own life by using his own gun can be looked at from a number of perspectives. Firstly, he was no coward. Secondly, he chose to go under his own terms. And thirdly, he had no hesitation in doing what he did, when and how he did it. I believe his motivations were that he had simply had enough mental torment. I wish he hadn't felt the need to turn off his problems in the way he did but I really do respect his right to choose his own solution and to make his own way out. He'd lived 50 more years since World War I and the event that robbed him of freedom and painless movement, there was nothing more left for him to do except to sit around and to continue to relive it all over and over again. Dalton Neville, NC, DCM, Mentioning Dispatches. I'd like now, um, if I can hold your attention, to, to talk about Sergeant Walter Wally Brown, VC DCM. This is, is a wonderful photo of Wally Brown that was given to me by his daughter, Pam, when she was living in the United States. Pam hardly knew her father, and we'll get round to that later, but she holds that this is probably the best photo of Wally there is. And believe me, Wally Brown, VC, there's been portraits there's been numerous photos. Pam says that most of them capture a mythological version of her father, a straight-backed man, serious and stern. Pam says this photo captures his irrepressible self, um, his independence and his ruggedness. The official Australian war correspondent and historian Charles Bean described Wally Bown as a type of man certain to distinguish himself if he survived. And Wally Brown, you know, he was distinguishing himself in funny ways, even as a kid. Um, he was born in New Norfolk in Tasmania and used to enjoy sailing on the Derwent River. And there's a family story that was passed to me that his heroes of his youth were Ernest Shackleton uh, and the Antarctic explorers. And that you, Brown, while a boy, started up correspondence with Shackleton. And Shackleton, not knowing his age, but being impressed with his knowledge of sailing and, and, and the outdoors, um, maintained this correspondence. And Brown took a passage, even whilst a young teen, took a passage on a ship to England and actually appeared in Shackleton's offices. And when Shackleton saw the age of his young correspondent, he packed him off and sent him home and told him not to bother to come back and try to get on an Antarctic expedition until he was at least growing a few hairs on his chin. It's a good story. Wally Brown went to the war late in the peace. Not that he didn't sign up early in the peace, but he just couldn't get a job in the infantry, and that's what he really wanted. When he first signed up, he found himself in Egypt in the Imperial Camel Corps. He wanted a transfer to the Western Front, and his medical records state that he got a case of otitis media which meant that the desert life was going to be no good for him. He went to France as a butcher in an Army Service Corps unit. Again, butchers didn't go near the front line. He sought another transfer and with his good mate Claude Clark Hughes joined the 20th Battalion. This was just before the Third Battle of Ypres in September 1917. During the, battle of, the third battle of Ypres, 
Wally Brown earned a DCM. The conditions at the front when Wally's battalion went into the line were described as a quagmire. Wally was prominent bandaging the wounded and carrying them under heavy shell fire back to the almost pathetic uh, protection of the blasted concrete pillboxes across the muddy sea of no man's land. Then a few days later, he led the remnant of his, his company in a bayonet charge to capture another position. When the battle was over, Wally was one of only six men of the original 200 men of his company still in the line. During the battle, his good friend Claude Hughes had been killed and Wally, who should have been going on leave to England, went down to Calais and had a cross made. And then again, while he should have been in England enjoying himself on leave with his mates, he carried the cross back to the battlefield and had it erected under fire where his mate had died. And that's the cross that you can see on your screen now. Wally's first taste of battle instilled in him a desire or a need to create a museum to recognise his battalion's work in the war. And Wally Brown became a collector. The things you can see on the screen are just some of the dozens, perhaps hundreds of items that Wally Brown collected from the battlefield. First with the view of making a 20th Battalion Museum and later when his collection had grown so huge to be part of the National Australian War Museum. All of these things can be viewed at the, War, at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra today. Wally's helmet, which features a dent where it was hit by shell. Signs from the battlefields of Ypres. You can see this one, Idiot Corner. Halley's Track. Anzac. Yorkshire Dump. Gas masks. The machine gun. The story behind the machine gun is the story of Wally's VC. The following year, in Ju on July the 5th, 1918, the day after the Battle of Hamel, Wally went into the front line. It was the job of his battalion would be to relieve the troops in the front line the following day, and Wally as a corporal had been sent forward to suss out the line and to have a look over where the men would be going. When he got there, he learnt that the men already in the field had just been ordered to go over the top again to capture a German machine gun that had been causing casualties. But those men were exhausted strung out after 24 hours of fighting. Wally said, I'll have a go at it myself. And taking just a couple of Mills bombs, another mate in the battalion thought he only took bombs and not a rifle because Wally was also looking for souvenirs for the museum. With a couple of Mills bombs in either hand, he went out into no man's land alone. He found the machine gun post and attacked it. Using the bombs in his hand as an enclosed fist, he, he beat down a German officer, capturing him and 12 other soldiers. Wally Brown was awarded a VC, though at the time, no officer pr had witnessed the attack and no officer could believe that it had occurred or been done by one man operating solo in no man's land. When Wally came home from the war, he was something of a celebrity, a VC hero. And there you can see uh, the John Longstaff portrait of Wally, the, the portrait that his daughter Pam um, didn't like at all, to be honest. She said it didn't capture uh, the real Wally. The picture, you can see the picture there with him at Buckingham Palace uh, being his, presented his medals by the royal family. Uh, and there in the bottom right hand corner is a picture of Wally um, being noted as the millionth visitor to the Australian War Memorial. Uh, when it was in Sydney in the 1920s. Wally, in his VC celebrity role, um, and I, I, I use celebrity a little bit lightly, he, he, was, he was absolutely motivated by mem memorialising and remembering the efforts of the soldiers in the war. And he collected and he archived uh, the collection for the war memorial with great passion and endeavour. He also was present at numerous important uh, national and state events, the opening of the Cenotaph in Sydney. Um, on poppy days, he would appear uh, giving out poppies on the streets. He married Maud Dillon in the 1920s and lived up in Leeton, 
and the wedding was attended by a guard of honour of eight VCs. And I read a newspaper article where Wally's mate, the groomsman, uh, who was also an ex-soldier, reckoned he felt very intimidated um, to being surrounded by so many VCs. Wally and Maud had two children, Pam, who I got to know, and a young son. Then, when the Second World War came round, Wally, aged 53, gave up his job with the... Uh, uh, on the water board in, in Leeton and enlisted again, putting down his age to something in, in his early 40s. And uh, there's a wonderful book um, put out by the Australian War Memorial called The Treasures from a Century of Collecting, which has a chapter on Wally Brown and his contribution to the Australian War Memorial. And in it, there's a quote um, from one of Wally's letters. He tells a mate of his why he went to the war. I could not resist the temptation of enlisting again when I saw the boys and many of the old diggers going away. And although I have a wife and two lovely kiddies to think about, I came to the conclusion that my duty was to serve my country and my family both. Wally went as a gunner to Malaya, and by February 1942, that division, the Australian 8th Division, um, had basically been given a dud check. The, the Japanese came hooting down through the Malayan Peninsula, captured Singapore. Tens of thousands of Australians were taken prisoner. The myth, the, the story recorded at the Australian War Memorial, says that Wally's last words to his mates were, no surrender for me. He disappeared into the jungle, carrying a few bombs, just like he'd done in his VC action in the First World War. And that's where the official story ends. If you look online, if you look at the War Memorial, that is what you'll see. His daughter Pam told me that when she was a young child, um, the loss of the father had been a terrible, terrible thing for the family, of course. And it was exacerbated by the loss of her brother, who died in an accident as well. Pam remembered when she was a child that a young man had come to the house, a young man who claimed that he had seen Wally on a beach in Malaya. And he said that the Japanese were coming and that Wally had given him a seat on a boat. And as the young Aussie boy pulled away with the other survivors, they turned and looked to the beach where they could see Wally and a band of other Australians being beheaded on the beach. This is the difference between official history the archive history and the stories that are told in, in homes. And again, I think now when we're considering and looking back and wondering what happened next, it's really important for historians, professional historians like me and families to get together and talk, to share stories, to share the archives and to share memory, photographs. Um, and Pam, Wally's daughter, a wonderfully eloquent person wrote me this. You may imagine that I have a less than starry-eyed view of the glory of war, but it is more complex than that. I grew up with enormous respect for Walter's reputation and pride in his heroism, but I always had to fight that with my longing for a father. My mother did everything she could as she slowly recovered to provide as perfect a home as she could, but she was a wounded animal and I could never really get near her again. My father died as he lived, a hero, but my mother was broken by his loss and that of my brother. As an adult, I looked back at it all at first with anger, but then slowly with a rational objectivity. I realized that something in him was exceptional and that he lived his life on his own terms. But it is, as they always say, those who are left who have to deal with the tragedy. My aunt told me that on the last day she saw him before he sailed for Singapore, he told her that he should be whipped for doing what he did. But he went anyway. He couldn't help it. It was another huge adventure. Pam also remembered as a kid that every year on, on some forgotten anniversary, dozens of soldiers would come to the house um, to commemorate Wally. Uh, 
I've often wondered what that anniversary was. Uh, was it the work he did in no man's land carrying and bandaging the wounded? Was it heroism in battle? Was it something else? He was a remarkable personality and everybody who met him and everybody recorded it, uh, stories of him seemed to be in awe of him. One of his former commanders gave Pam a piano when she was a child and encouraged her to do well at school because that's what her father would have wanted. But the story that Pam told me that, and a story that she really held on to was uh, one night walking home, you know, typical night, little girl, mum and dad coming home, it's all, it's all falling apart at the seams a little bit, and Pam was getting stroppy and she no longer wanted to carry her teddy. Well, Wally tucked the teddy bear under his arm. And Wally's wife, Maud, you know, being of that generation, didn't want the man of the house to be seen carrying a stuffed teddy bear down the street. But Wally, in a nice way, told Maud that he was going to carry that damn doll, that damn teddy, no matter what. And he didn't mind what he looked like. He would carry it for his daughter. And I think perhaps for Pam, that was that one fleeting memory of what a father really is. The last bloke I want to talk about is an absolute cracker. And this is him in the bottom right of the picture. This is Jack Hayes, uh, the lad we saw on the very opening slide coming back. You'll remember the first slide with his sister on one arm, his doctor on the other, 23 years old, looking really to me almost middle-aged in that original photo. Here he is as a 19-year-old on the 31st of August, 1914, just days after he signed up, one of the original soldiers of 1st Australian Division. Uh, that's him with his arm over a double-barreled shotgun, cigarette in hand, wearing his uh, compulsory militia uniform from before the war. These photos, again, so iconic, held in family collections. Uh, this one's held, again, by the Hayes family. And uh, I love just looking closely at these photos. If you see in the background, you can see a sign in this makeshift bar. It says, wanted man with wooden leg to mash potatoes. Apply at bar. Uh, Jack Hayes is an example of perhaps a story that all Australians should know more about. And I'm, at the moment, I'm writing a, another book um, with Jack as the protagonist. So, and I've also written quite a bit about Jack's wartime exploits and stealth raiders. I won't go too much into his war today. Um, we'll talk about what happened next, but I'll just give you a quick overview. So Jack was born in Hay in country New South Wales, grew up in Bathurst, where he was known as Mick or Mickey Dripping because uh, his father was an Irishman, an Irishman who'd come to Australia uh, to get away from the troubles um, of Ireland at the, in those times and, and to start a life of new opportunity, fresh opportunities in Australia. Staunch Labor people, his dad was the auditor of the National Advocate, a Labor um, daily paper in Bathurst. Um, there were neighbours of who, uh, Chifley, um, who had become the Prime Minister of Australia, and one of Australia's most significant Prime Ministers in the post-war era. Uh, Chifley was an engine driver in Bathurst, and they lived on the same street as the Chifleys. And that connection to that that uh, railways community led to Jack and family moving to Sydney just before the war. Jack took up a job as a engine cleaner in the railways, the job trajectory being engine cleaner, engine cleaner, fireman, driver. And for a working class lad, a job in the railways was a real opportunity. Um, it was a, a real mark of honour in a working class uh, suburbs like Marrickville where he lived. When Jack went to the war, he landed at Gallipoli on the first day and he was wounded shortly afterwards. And just to give you a glimpse of his personality, he wrote a wonderful letter home to a friend in Bathurst from his hospital bed uh, under the pyramids in Egypt. This is days after he's got back from Gallipoli, from the very first morning at Gallipoli. He writes, I suppose you've heard about our baptism of fire. They seemed very wild at us for paying them a visit so early on a Sunday morning but our boys did not seem to mind them in the least. I happened to stop a bit of their Turkish delight. The doctor said he will let me go back to Gallipoli as soon as some of the others are ready. The hospital will drive me off my head if I have to stop here long, 
Fancy only stopping in the field for five hours. Hard luck, eh? I'll bet I'll stop there a bit longer next time. Indeed he did. Jack went back to Gallipoli in May 1915 and fought at the Battle of Lone Pine, which his friend Archie Barwick described as a frightful battle. Barwick said, our boys and the Turks lay three and four deep and on, on top of these we had to fight for our lives. After Gallipoli, Jack went to the Western Front and he was involved in nearly every major battle his battalion took part in. On the eve of the Battle of Pozieres in July 1916, he was promoted to sergeant in the field. And I recall reading his diary, which was lent to me by his, his late son, John Hayes. And Jack wrote, you know, feeling confident but a bit shaky, continue this after the push. And he fought in that battle and he fought in numerous other battles. And his diaries are full of uh, examples of his wit. Um, you know, for instance, he, he once took leave, you know, without asking and rode a push bike to see the Prince of Wales um, and simply wrote, can't ride much. Uh, he, he had that black humour of, of a digger, you know, in the trenches at Hill 60 near Ypres. He, he wrote that the rats mobilised in our rear but did not launch an attack. Um, by 1918, he was company quartermaster sergeant in the 1st Battalion and he was one of only about 80 originals left in the battalion, 80 of the original men who'd landed at Gallipoli on the 25th of April 1918. And he was due Anzac leave a form of leave for those 1914 enlistees to go home to Australia and have a rest. When the Battle of Amiens began, Jack, expecting leave, went absent without leave into no man's land looking for souvenirs to take back to Australia. Whilst he was uh, absent without leave, having a good old look around the battlefield, he realised that the English, a full division, some 15,000 Englishmen on the, on the left flank of the Australians on the opposite bank of the Somme River, were in trouble and that they could not reach their objective, which was an important high ground known as Chipley Spur that overlooked the Australian Corps attack. So Jack, with his mate Harold Andrews and four other Aussies, crossed the river, picked up a company of Englishmen and led them to their objective. Rather than racing headlong at the German machine gunners on the high ground as the British had done for 30 hours at the cost of 2,000 casualties, Jack and his mates went almost like guerrilla soldiers through the dead ground, through the fields, sweeping in behind the German positions and eradicating them with gunfire and uh, taking numerous prisoners who they ferried back to the British. In four hours of fighting, they advanced three kilometres, six men, and captured the entire objective of a British division, securing the flank of the Australian Corps' advance in the most decisive battle of the war. Um, how this bloke has not been remembered uh, better in Australian digger legends is beyond me. Um, but yes, official histories and the histories of, of what really happened don't always meet. But I'll be writing about that in my next book. Jack, a week after this incredible exploit at Chipoli, was shot in the chest while trying to rush a German post at a place called the Schweinia Valley. The bullet penetrated three inches into his abdomen. Now, stomach wounds were usually grave, highly painful, and would usually kill. Jack was taken from the battlefield very, very quickly, and he got to a hospital in Wales. The doctors in Wales were in a quandary. Anybody shot in the stomach was most likely to die. 80% of stomach wounds died in the First World War. And, and the medical history of stomach wounds sort of dated back to the American Civil War, the Napoleonic Wars, and the doctors knew that if you operated, surgically operated on a stomach wound, the soldier was just as likely to die from an infection caused by the operating tools or the hands of the surgeon as from the wound itself. But the doctors knew from their medical history that if you left the man with a stomach wound alone, he had a 20% chance of survival. This was called the conservative approach. So the doctors in England weren't prepared to take out the bullet. In essence, what they decided to do was to allow Jack to go home to Australia and die in his mother's arms. Here's Jack at left in this photo, another wonderful Australian photo from the First World War. So Jack 
came home to Australia and the Australian doctors were bolder than the doctors in Wales. And they said to Jack, we think we can operate. We'll, we'll have a go and we'll get this bullet out. You know, let's give you some surety. As, as I said before, there was a lot of risk involved in an operation on the stomach. But Jack decided that he'd, he'd go with the operation. And he asked that the operation occur on the 25th of April, 1919, the anniversary of the first day he landed with the first Anzacs. The operation was a success. Jack went home to his mother and father in Marrickville, Sydney. And a few years later, he met a girl walking down Pitt Street in Sydney who had been a neighbour of his in Bathurst when he was a boy. That girl's name was Ivy May Hayes, and the two married shortly afterwards. Jack couldn't keep up his job in the railways. The work was just too physical, too demanding. So he took to, to night courses and qualified as a draftsman for the Sydney Water Board. But what really occupied his time was a new returned soldiers club, the Marrickville Anzac Memorial Club, that formed in the working class suburb of Marrickville, Sydney. And it was with some mates from this club on the eve of Anzac Day in 1927 that Jack was walking home in the early hours just as the dawn was creeping in. Jack and his mates had had quite a few drinks the night before at the Gallipoli Club. And as they made their way through Martin Place in Sydney, they stopped and they saw an old lady placing a wreath where the cenotaph was being built. Jack, during the war, was not the type of bloke who would stop to say a prayer, but he stopped in reverence with this lady and his mates, they all stopped there and they said a prayer with the old lady and then they turned and continued their walk home. And you can imagine, like any Aussie boys, shoulders bumping, big night out, walking through the streets to their homes. But on this walk, they made a vow that they would return the next year at dawn and do honour to their mates, do honour to the Anzac tradition that began at Gallipoli on the 25th of April. And sure enough, the next year, 1928, was the first dawn service of a kind that we recognise today that was ever held in Australia. And the lad there on the left of your screen was one of the originators of the idea and of the foundational committee he was certainly the inspiration, the only one who'd been at the original Anzac Day in 1915. And I'd like to read to you, as we approach the closing time today, the closing of my talk, what the newspaper said the following year at that first dawn service. Anzac Day, 1928. Most solemn, perhaps, of all the day's observances, was the two minutes of silence that followed the placing of two wreaths on the cenotaph as dawn streaked the sky over Martin Place at 4.30 a.m. yesterday. The significance of the hour corresponding with that when the first fruits of the sacrifices of Gallipoli were gathered in was very real to the knot of 150 persons who gathered round the simple, eloquent stone. The eerie silence of the night was intensified when those bareheaded men and bowed women and children gave their feeling token of two minutes mute respect and remembrance. There was not even a trumpet call, nor a spoken prayer. The silence was all. Then, as silently, they moved away again to their homes. As the people moved away, one old lady, perhaps the lady they had met the year before, partly crippled with age and obvious long distress, haltingly walked to the foot of the cenotaph, where among the array of beautiful and expensive wreaths, she hid modestly her token of long remembering, a tiny bunch of white daisies, picked from some suburban garden and held together with a piece of cord. She could not have given more, for coupled with the posy was the pathos of her coming at so early an hour. Jack Hayes, one of the founders of Australia's first dawn service at Martin Place, Sydney. Jack's son, John, was great company 
uh, when I was writing Stealth Raiders and, and and the, the material that he shared with me is going towards what I hope will be another book on Jack Hayes and the Chipley Six. Jack, John told me that as a boy he could put his fist in the hole in his father's chest. But, Jack, but John said, you know, Jack was not destined to die in battle. His life was dedicated to his past soldier friends. And in 1968, Jack was uh, awarded a British Empire medal for his service to return servicemen and their families in Marrickville, Sydney. These were times when, you know, only men's names were mentioned in the paper and men received awards. But I have it on good authority from the family that this really was an award to be shared between Jack and his wife, May. May Hayes, like the other women and family members in my stories today, were real heroes in the story of the return of these men. Jack and May Hayes together um, supported their community in Marrickville, supported the women and children of the returned men. And I think that their family uh, would like that to be acknowledged today. When Jack Hayes died in the mid-1970s, he was still, as he had when he was a digger, enjoying a cigarette and a couple of beers a day. He was a larrikin and a very fine, fine gentleman. And his motto, which was a motto that was bestowed upon the Merrick Anzac Club, love thy neighbour and go home quietly. And thank you. That's where I'd like to finish my talk today. I hope you've enjoyed reflecting on these men and how they remembered their fallen mates. And I'll leave you with that quote there from, from Albert Eddie Edwards, uh, who I started with, started with Albert's description of coming home into Sydney Harbour. Um, but every Remembrance Day, this quote from Eddie comes to my mind. It, it's amazing when you read so many digger diaries, some things just get burned into your mind. And, and this is, this is uh, Eddie's form of remembrance. He remembers his fallen comrades and then in thinking of them, let us give thought to their women folk. The soldier died once, but his mother died many times. She lived in agony from casualty list to casualty list without an hour's respite from fear or dread. Thank you. Lucas, Lucas thank you so much. Um, um, very, 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 very moving talk. Uh, it was really a very uh, fitting uh, way for us to commemorate Remembrance Day and um, especially thank you for having included two local diggers in that uh, in the talk. That was really terrific. Look, we've got three questions and I would like to ask them of you. Yeah. Um, we'll have to be brief if I can ask you to be very brief in your answers because, um, yeah, we'll, we're running out of time. Okay, but so, um, the first question, um, which has got some interest from our listeners, obviously, um, and you've acknowledged the, the important role of women uh, in uh, how the men fared when they got back home to Australia. This is a question asking if you've done any research on women who actually served in the war as nurses or whatever, and how um, how they fared when they came home? Mm. Um, it's a great question. To be honest, I at the moment I'm writing a book about uh, Jack Hayes and, and his six mates who captured Chipperley Spur, and I touched on that at the end there. And in writing that book I realised that the story is actually the story of return is as much a story about families and the women and people's lives and communities as it is about the men. Um, so I've sort of become, my eyes and my ears are open to the stories of women in the 1920s and 1930s. I haven't followed any nurses um, except to say where, for instance, like Dudley Tregent's wife was a nurse and another chap that I'm researching, his wife was a nurse in the front lines uh, uh, nursing posts as well. Um, if that person wants to get in contact with me, uh, I have been following a nurse with the surname of Cashin, who was very prominent in the returned soldiers and nurses movement in Sydney. 
and was a part of the Marek Valanzac club that I was referring to at the end as well. So, um, yes, that's probably about as far as I could really, really uh, say. Okay, lovely. Thank you. So um, I hope the people who are interested in that question um, heard the answer and um, we could certainly put them in touch with you. Um, this, the second question was, um, it was referring to the movie Gallipoli, actually, and oh. that movie um, is kind of an iconic movie in Australia. And the question is, just wondering how realistically you considered the movie Gallipoli to be in depicting Australian society at the time? Mm. Um, I think it did a pretty good, you know, I, to be honest, I love that movie. Um, and it's probably tempered with the fact I saw it as a kid. Um, so, you know, I still think uh, the flaws in that movie might be more towards, you know, the, some of the, uh, the blame being laid on the British. But I think its depiction of Australian society is quite accurate. I remember the character Frank um, with his drunk Irish father. Um, now, I, I come from an Irish background myself, so I'm not saying that we're all drunk, but the father's quotes in the movie are all about, you know, um, bitterness towards the British Empire and, and whether indeed Frank should be going to the war. Um, and a, a lot of that movie is based in country towns where there was a huge amount of empire loyalty. Uh, so the other young, young lad, Archie, you know, goes off to the war um, from one of those country towns where, you know, basically it's 1914, the levels of patriotism and loyalty to the empire were huge and a lot of the, the rifts um, emerged by 1916 when the casualty lists had got so huge, when the economic strain of the war was really apparent in homes. Um, so I think in general it does a pretty good job of representing, um, let's say, Australia with all its promise um, as a working man's paradise when all of that young generation of the 1890s suddenly go off to a war and go from um, boyhood into a warrior's life. Uh, but, of course, that movie doesn't really touch on what happens next. The, the protagonist is shot down um, at the Battle of the Neck in the last scene. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the last question is, I would like to know if the families who were so patriotic and proud of volunteerism at the beginning of the war felt the same way on their return. Yeah. Um, each return was different, you know, and, I, and so I think each family was different. But I can see I know more about the soldiers themselves, you know, and some of those men who went with fierce loyalty and things like that. One thing that was interesting about the conscription debates is that the diggers themselves voted no to compulsory military service. Um, on the one hand, it's because they didn't want to fight with somebody who didn't want to be there. But you also see references to people saying, look, do not send little brother John because this is just this is just shit. You know, this is hell. Um, so people's attitudes to the war certainly changed. Uh, and again, I think we perhaps ha haven't understood enough just how many sacrifices were being made at home particularly if you were a working family, a working family and you're economically struggling, you've got boys at the war and then you're faced with um, the tragedy of loss. Uh, I think many families perhaps changed their attitude a little bit, but also the strength of the Anzac legend has been to continue to commemorate and celebrate almost as a form of catharsis because of those 66,000 men who were killed Families never had an opportunity to bury them. And families never had a physical opportunity for closure. So how that affected individual families is a topic I think that maybe each of us can go home and talk to our own um, grandparents and so forth about and find out how, the, how in each of those families they dealt with it. Lucas, thank you so much again. We will have to uh, draw it to a close at this point. Um, but thank you so much. I, I was personally incredibly moved hearing those stories. We really look forward to hearing about the publication of the next book that you're working on. And um, we really hope that we will be able to have you back again to Kingston Libraries.
Um, just a reminder for those who are uh, listening that we have recorded this talk. We do hope to be able to pop it up on our YouTube channel before too long. So if you know of anybody who wanted to attend today but wasn't able to, or if you'd just like to say, hey, Lucas Jordan gave a great talk for Kingston Libraries, check it out. Um, please, please keep an eye out on our YouTube channel. So I'll say thank you very much again, Lucas, for today's talk. Thank you everyone for listening and we'll say goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you to you too.